Secretary Priti Patel. Ms Patel, great to have you on the show again. I do hope you're well. Um, lots, of, lots, of course, to talk about in terms of the changes uh, to immigration and, uh, and asylum. But I wonder if we can start, though, with, with COVID-19 uh, and the vaccines. Those comments that the Prime Minister made uh, to Conservative MP, MPs last night, uh, when he said that the UK's vaccine success was, was due to capitalism and greed, what did he mean? Well, look, I, I actually wasn't in the meeting, so I didn't hear those remarks. But I think, first of all, Prime Minister always acknowledges the strong success that we've had in terms of the vaccine, not just the roll, rollout, which is incredible, but also our ability as a country to develop the vaccine, um, the role that pharmaceutical companies and science and technology has played in that. And actually, I think that speaks to a great strength that we have as a country. And linked to that, of course, look at our contributions to COVAX, the international scheme to get vaccine supplies elsewhere, and demonstrate that we are very very strong force for good internationally when it comes to vaccine science um, and pharmaceutical development. Uh, well, I understand, of course, that you weren't in the meeting, but it does appear that the, that the Prime Minister stopped channeling his inner Gordon Gecko and backtracked, per perhaps because of the fact that, as things stand, reports this morning that the European Union is about to uh, announce the measures that they can put in place to slow the transit of vaccines uh, from the continent to the United Kingdom. I, I wonder what you make of that and whether or not you see that perhaps as a, a, a success down to you know, capitalism and greed. Well, I think, first of all, when it comes to the European Union, discussions are always ongoing in terms of the vaccine and supplies of the vaccine. And it's important, it's absolutely imperative that we all work together in a collective way and a responsible way, because this is about saving lives. This is exactly what the vaccine is doing. Yesterday, we marked the annual, the year anniversary of lockdown, but also took great reflection as a nation in terms of the lives that have been lost and also how far we have come over the last 12 months. So I don't think this is about, you know, really just, just sort of criticising vaccine supplies. We've got to work together, support each other and just ensure, as we've got taking place anyway across government, that dialogue continues, discussions are constantly underway and that's right and proper. Um, well, let's move uh, straight on to your brief, uh, shall we, Home Secretary, and, uh, and some fairly significant changes that you're making today to immigration policy, the detail of which has already been quite, uh, quite well reported. So I wonder if you might uh, uh, just, exactly, just establish exactly what, what the point of all this is. What, what is the end goal of the changes that you're making to the immigration system? So today I am effectively announcing a new plan for immigration. And this builds upon the work that we've already done with regards to immigration. So we've ended free movement, we've developed the point-based system, but that's the legal side of immigration and migration. We have a fundamental problem actually in the world when it comes to illegal migration. And lives are being lost too frequently with people trying to basically travel, flee, but also come to the United Kingdom in the hands of people smugglers. So today I am announcing changes um, which will be subject to consultation, and I'll be announcing this in Parliament later on today. There'll be a command paper where we're looking at a range of options as to how we can reform the entire asylum system. And importantly, for people that are fleeing persecution um, from terrible parts of the world, we, see, we know for a fact there are something like 80 million people that are displaced in the world. We want to create safe and legal routes for them in terms of how they can be protected and also be received in our asylum system in the right way as asylum seekers and be supported in their resettlement in the United Kingdom. Tell, tell us then just a little bit more, um, Home Secretary, what are these uh, legitimate routes to claiming asylum here in the United Kingdom? As things stand, isn't it the case that you have to be in the United Kingdom uh, to make an application for asylum? Well, that's the point. We are looking to create safe and legal routes to support people that are fleeing persecution. Currently, we have records number of people. Even yesterday, we had 150 people um, in the hands of smugglers come over to the United Kingdom. No one, no one denies that there is an issue with people coming across the channel. I'm just wondering what, what these new legitimate routes to claiming asylum will be. Well, we're, we're publishing a paper today where we're discussing and putting out to consultation how we will develop new safe and legal routes, working as we've done, as we do already as a government with the likes of UNHCR, refugee agencies, to support people 
who are fleeing, but in country. So in country and how we can develop those routes, because this is really important. By developing safe and legal routes, we stop people from being put in the hands of smugglers and people traffickers. Too many people have died trying to come to the United Kingdom. We've got to break this people smuggling model. We've got to put in safe and legal routes. And we've actually got to be able to help genuine asylum seekers, um, not just flee persecution, but be resettled in the United Kingdom. Currently our asylum system is overwhelmed. We have a number of areas that we are announcing today where we're looking at... Where is, where is, where is, the, where is the evidence, though, um, Home Secretary? Where is the evidence that the change, these changes... Where is the evidence that these changes will, will convince people not to take these routes? I mean, if you're fleeing genocide, if you're fleeing rape gangs, if you're fleeing war, your priority is survival. It, it, it strikes me that the first thing that people will want to do is get away rather than necessarily pop down to the British Embassy. Well, actually, that's exactly why we will create safe and legal routes working with the right kind of partners. And to be, to be frank, now, we've done this already. If you look at the Syrian resettlement scheme, 25,000 people have been resettled in the United Kingdom through a safe and legal route. And this is effectively what, what we want to create much more of to help people. Currently, the people that are coming over to the United Kingdom are predominantly individual men leaving behind women and children that are fleeing persecution, that desperately need help. And we need to change our asylum system from an end-to-end -end perspective. So there are lots of structures that we need to change within the system itself. So we need to change our approach, not just to case working, but the way in which we can help people, yes, get to the United Kingdom and be resettled in the United Kingdom. And currently we simply do not have an effective system that is doing that because our system is being gained by people, smugglers and facilitators and this is what we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh. Nearly 60% of what we have in our asylum system right now, people there, have come to the United Kingdom through illegal routes, putting their own... You've, you've made, you've, we've made, we've made that point, we've made that point, Home Secretary. I just want to know what happens, though. The biggest problem appears to be people on the other side of the channel coming to the United Kingdom and, and claiming asylum. Under the new system that you're proposing, if people cross the channel illegally, claim asylum and have that asylum claim fail, what happens to them? Well, part of our plan and our approach will be around how we remove people and return people to their countries that they have travelled from. So we have to remember the we don't majority... have any arrangements in place with, with, with the well, European Union for well, that to take place? Well, we will have arrangements in place, and that is what we're doing right now in terms of bilateral negotiations to put arrangements in place. And it's important to remember, if you're fleeing persecution, people can claim asylum in the first safe country. So France, Germany... Italy, Belgium, Spain, many people are traveling to the United Kingdom from these safe countries. So the principle of fleeing, fleeing persecution under the Refugee Convention and seeking asylum is very much about, yes, going to a safe country and people are still shopping through safe countries and coming to the United Kingdom. But, but all of this rests on those, those, those bilateral agreements, doesn't it? If Germany says no, if France says no, if any of those countries say no, then we will, in this essence, have a situation in which people are, you know, indefinitely detained in the United Kingdom? Well, it's not just about European Union countries, and I think it's important. You've already heard me saying this. So it's, quite, it's quite a lot about European countries, though, isn't it? People ...who are displaced around the world right now. EU countries also have a moral duty and a responsibility to be part of this solution. And today, I'll be at the G6 talking about this very issue and making the case for reform of asylum and absolutely sticking to the principle of claiming asylum in the first safe country, because currently that is not taking place. We all have a moral duty and responsibility to save lives and stop people smuggling, and this is a collective endeavour where we must all step up. Are we, are, are, is part of the proposal that, that, that's being put out to consultation the idea that places like Gibraltar, the Isle of Man, could be used? Uh, can you reject that speculation? I mean, certainly it was rejected, uh, set, rejected by the authorities in Gibraltar. Well, first of all, all the time people are being trafficked and smuggled through illegal routes. We as a government have a duty and a responsibility to consider all options, and that is the purpose of our concept. So we, are, we will look at third country removal, and we will also do that alongside looking at bilateral agreements. So this will be work that this government is undertaking right now. And as part of this consultation, we will put all options on the table in terms of working with their countries. And countries like Denmark are already exploring options like this. And we will continue to explore bilaterally options in terms of returning and removing people that have come to the United Kingdom legally.
Um, Home Secretary, I wonder if we can just touch on, on policing at the tail end of our, our conversation this morning and, and, of course, the police bill uh, going through the Commons at the moment. Um, that which we saw in, in Bristol at the weekend, what could the police have done in Bristol uh, at the weekend under the proposed legislation that they can't currently do? Well, first of all, in terms of the changes, um, and obviously this is subject to parliamentary procedure in the Commons and committee stages with the bill itself, this is very much about changes to static process, um, protests. So as we know, the um, Public, Public Order Act needs updating. It was put in place in the 1980s but we're seeing new tactics being used by static protesters. So we've seen individuals such as and organizations like Exile glue themselves to buildings, cause a great deal of public disruption, stop ambulances from getting out to emergency calls. And the powers- but, but events, like the, events like the one we saw in Bristol at the weekend could, could, could be policed in the way that they, under the, the legislation that we currently have though. Absolutely not. And this is the point. The police do not have the powers to remove individuals that are causing a disruption and also threat to life. We saw last year and the year before last as well, through the protests that took place, threats to life. Um, I saw it myself with dangerous, dangerous situations with particular protesters rigging themselves up to vehicles and to fuel tanks and putting the lives of other people at risk alongside stopping... Well, why is that not just a bog-standard public order offence? Sorry, Neil, I... So, so, sorry for interrupting, because we're just about to run up. I'm just wondering, the stuff that you're describing, why is that not just a, a bog-standard public order offence? Because these are new tactics that protesters are using, and they're dangerous tactics. So these are tactics that we have to consider as part of the bill. We're working with the police on this as well. Um, and we work with the police every time there are protests where there are issues that we can learn from. And there are currently gaps in the legislation. As I said, the legislation itself is outdated. It's from the 1980s. 